Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon, Team Krulak community. My name is Major Ian Brown. I'm the Operations Officer at the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Creativity. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Krulak Center, welcome back to the Brutecast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. We will also be recording this webcast for the benefit of those in our community of interest who can't join us today. So we ask that you be mindful of keeping your microphones muted to avoid disrupting the presentation, as well as keeping your webcams cams off to help us stream smoothly. So with that, I'm happy to turn the mic over to Dr. Brandon Valeriano, the Krulak Center's Bren Chair for Military Innovation, to introduce today's guest. Dr. Valeriano, over to you. Hello, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Paul Deal. Uh, Paul Deal is Associate Provost and the Asheville Smith Professor of Political Science and the director of the Center of Teaching and Learning at the University of Texas, Dallas. He was previously uh, named chair at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and has been in the past the president of the Peace Science Association and the president of the International Studies Association. And personally, I've known Paul for as long as I've been in this field. So he's been a mentor, maybe a friend, but maybe I'm probably friendlier with his wife and talking about cooking there. But that's how Facebook goes. But I'm delighted to have Paul here, and I'm delighted he's going to talk to us about peacekeeping. This is one of his core research areas among many research areas, but this is all very important for the Marine Corps University community since we typically mainly talk about how we get into wars and not how we end them. So with that, I'll leave it to Paul Deal, and afterwards we'll have our usual Q&A, which I'll moderate, so you can raise your hand or you can type in questions in the chat box. Thank you, and over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Brandon, and thank you for the opportunity to the Marine Corps University and the Crew Lock Center. Talking about something a little different that I'm not sure military officials think a lot about, but it's something that has become a critical mission for militaries around the world, and that's the participation in peacekeeping. And in particular, I want to talk about changes that have taken place in peacekeeping over time and some of the implications we have for the success of those peacekeeping operations, uh, as well as some other issues uh, such as training and evaluating their success. Let's start with a, a little bit of history. What I call traditional peacekeeping, but you may have heard referred to as Cold War peacekeeping, old peacekeeping, is the model of peacekeeping that begins in the late 1940s comes to fruition uh, in the 1960s and pretty much lasts till the end of the Cold War in around 1991. And for that, the mission for the peacekeeping soldiers is relatively narrow and straightforward. It's ceasefire monitoring. Typically, the peacekeepers are deployed after a ceasefire, so there's usually an agreement between that. It's done particularly after an interstate conflict. So, for example, between Israel and Egypt in the 1956 or 1967 war, the peacekeepers are placed as a buffer along a defined ceasefire line where they separate the disputants. So it's often referred to as an interposition force. And their deployment takes place prior to a peace agreement meaning they haven't settled the kind of dispute, but all they've agreed to is to stop fighting, at least for the time being. And traditional peacekeeping, particularly through the United Nations, was characterized by what some referred to in a religious reference, the Holy Trinity. And the Holy Trinity first was based on host state consent. So if peacekeepers and soldiers were gonna to go to a particular area, they had to have the consent or the cooperation of that host state respecting national sovereignty. Usually if it's an interstate conflict, it was a cooperation of both sides. Second was impartiality. Even though they may have been a military force, they were not designed to affect the military balance between the two sides or to take actions that necessarily favored or inherently favored one side or the other. 
Now, if there are ceasefire violations, they could take action against the one side, but they would do that if the other side was as guilty as well. So they began as an impartial force. And third, the rules of engagement were fairly narrow. They were designed to limit uh, the use of military force, largely to a defensive posture. So peacekeepers weren't designed to use offensive military force to take action, but were lightly armed and only took action in response to being attacked or in order to response to breaking of a ceasefire. Uh, my joke is generally is your average street gang in the United States was better armed than your average peacekeeping soldier who may have perhaps only carried a uh, simple rifle. Well, things have changed. In the Cold War era from 1991 to the present, there's been a dramatic change in peace operations in a number of ways. First, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of operations that take place in the post, should say, Cold War era. Prior to the end of the Cold War, you may have had roughly about 20 to 30 different kinds of operations. Now, if we include political missions, and peace operations carried out by agents other than the United Nations, you could count up to 200 different kind of operations, not just from the UN, but the European Union, African Union, and multinational coalitions. They're now deployed not to interstate conflicts primarily, but to civil war, internationalized civil war contexts. So whereas deployment between Ethiopia and Eritrea in the post-Cold War era would have been typical, in the 60s and 70s, it's now an exception. And more likely you have peacekeeping operations sent to places like Sierra Leone or Mali. Critically, when we start looking at the changes in the Holy Trinity, soldiers are now being deployed to what has been referred to as less permissive environments. That is to say, host state consent is no longer an absolute requirement. In fact, in some cases, when you're being sent to failed states like Somalia, there really isn't a host state to consent, or it's not meaningful to have host state consent when you're deployed to a civil war with a very weak state and rebels controlling different areas. They're also now being deployed in different kinds of area, different kinds of conflict phases. I said the Cold War peacekeeping was one that usually took place at a ceasefire after a ceasefire, but prior to a peace agreement. Now they're actually being deployed during active conflict. They're still being, again, deployed after a ceasefire, but frequently now peacekeepers are put in place after a peace agreement takes place. So oftentimes there's a peace agreement between the disputants, there's agreements to have elections, and the peacekeeping force is part of the implementation of that agreement. But what they all share now are broader rules of engagement. This is what the UN and others refer to as robust peacekeeping, which means that peacekeepers can use offensive use of military force, the way that they're equipped with tanks, uh, certain types of other kind of logistics, more closely resemble a traditional military force than they did in the Cold War kind of era. And what I'd like to focus on today in the presentation, and I think most critically, is they're performing many different missions in the course of peacekeeping that go well beyond ceasefire monitoring. Let's take a look at some of those kinds of missions. My colleagues and I are involved in a research project which we call the Multiple Missions Project, examining UN peacekeeping operations uh, from their inception in 1948 now until roughly 2016 when our data gathering has ended. And we've identified the missions before you uh, on the screen in the slides, as well as a couple others, but these are the primary ones that peacekeeping missions to varying degree now perform. You'll note at the top, traditional peacekeeping or ceasefiring monitoring is the one that they've always done during Cold War peacekeeping and is still a vital part of UN peace operations. And again, that's putting them as a buffer or interposition force to separate the combatants, prevent accidental or even purposive 
re-engagement, and hopefully promote the kind of environment that's suitable for conflict resolution. But as they say in infomercials, but wait, there's more. When you look at some of the other kinds of missions that they're doing, they go beyond that kind of traditional kind of mission. Because peace operations are deployed often in war-torn or areas that just finished active fighting with many refugees and serious other problems, many of them deliver humanitarian assistance as well. And peace operations play the role of distributing those, providing protection for non-governmental organizations like the Red Cross uh, as well to facilitate the delivery of food and medical supplies during the course of the conflict. Third, peacekeepers are, play the role of election supervision or the promotion of democracy. Many of the peace agreements that were signed between governments and rebel forces provide for democratic elections in the aftermath of that agreement. But to ensure that those elections are free and fair from the time that we begin with registering voters to making sure that violence is limited around the time of the actual voting, peacekeepers play the role of third-party guarantors to provide a stable environment in which elections can take place. Because clearly no rebel group is going to rely on the government to run a free and fair elections, and the government itself is going to be worried that rebels will disrupt that. Peacekeepers as the third party play that role. Known as DDR, the fourth kind of mission is disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. Following the end, particularly of a civil war, there's a period where particularly rebel groups and others have to be disarmed. There has to be collection of weapons, ammunition, small arms, uh, before we can move to a further stage in the peace process. Well, someone needs to monitor that. Again, the government's not going to rely on the honest words of the rebels that they've given up all their arms. There needs to be a third party to monitor, collect, and, and verify that. That's the disarmament phase. Demobilization follows from that when rebel militias and others uh, disband and become less of a fighting force and therefore a threat to the stability of the host state. And finally, part of the process is reintegration. It's where you take ex-combatants who are now civilians and bring them into the, the society, providing employment for them and income, and that usually happens after a civil war. Fifth is human rights protecting threatened populations. Uh, during the course of active civil wars or in the aftermath, it's often civilians who are most at risk. And the UN has instituted in most of its peace operations in the last 10 or 20 years, a civilian protection mandate. And it's up to the peace operation force to do that. There are different ways to do that. Providing safe havens, you could have no-fly zones, you could monitor the um, transportation or movement of civilians across battle lines. Thinking more broadly and going into what is often referred to as peace building or state building is the part of peace now missions that look more toward the long term and taking failed states or weak states and rebuilding them at the end of a civil war. This involves a series of missions. The first is security sector reform. In order to rebuild society, you need to have law and order in the cities and towns there and the protection of civilians beyond uh, uh, just refugee camps. Some of this resembles kind of rebuilding national militaries or reconfiguring uh, local and national police forces. So there's often a cooperation between the local peace forces and indigenous uh, national police forces. That's referred to in the UN as SSR, security sector reform. There's also the process that in order to prevent the renewal of war, you need to reestablish or establish a society that's based on the rule of law. And that means having the kind of legal processes and institutions where you can maintain order. And so you have 
laws built into the national constitution to the to the national government locally that allow for the processes of government to work and disputes and disagreements that take place don't aren't solved on the battlefield but rather are mediated through those political and legal institutions local governance goes hand in hand with that as the eighth mission it's the provision of standard government services and, and government institutions. Peace operations often assist rebuilding the government structures, not just in the, in the capital city of the country, in a place like the Congo, but extending to the major cities and the outlying areas in the rest of the country. And last, usually in the process, is the idea that preventing the renewal of conflict and getting a functioning society involves more than just institutions. It means changing some of the attitudes among the disputants and an acceptance and tolerance among them, whether they were government supporters or rebel supporters. So in the aftermath, peace operations have also been charged with providing legal mechanisms for holding those responsible for atrocities that have taken place, as well as promoting things like truth and reconciliation commissions to provide a sense of healing in those kind of different areas. Those are different kinds of missions that peace operations, particularly in the UN, have been asked to perform. To address now is how frequently do those occur? What kind of patterns can we see? In our analysis of UN peace operations, 70 of them from 1948 to 2016, we find that post-corp Peace operations are really multidimensional. They do far more than ceasefire monitoring. The table you see before you lists a couple missions and a couple others, preventive deployment and coercive peacekeeping that I, I did mention but are, but are infrequent. And you can see how often those different missions are performed. Not surprisingly, traditional peacekeeping missions, ceasefire missionings are there with almost four fifths of the operations. So those haven't gone away, those haven't changed. But what has changed is the frequency of other kinds of missions. Over half of UN peace operations now explicitly in that period deal with humanitarian assistance. And even though this is over the 48 to 2016 period, the humanitarian assistance mission is even more common in most recent operations. Half have the provision of dealing with a local security law and order security sector kind of reform. But it's frequent that they're asked to supervise democratic elections, to promote the rule of law, to have re restoration, reconciliation kind of functions. There's lots of different kinds of missions they're asked to perform. In our analysis of different kinds of patterns that go within the peace operations, there's probably no one, two, or even three common configurations. Most have the traditional ceasefiring monitoring function, trying to evade violence as a core kind of mission. But after that, when one looks at particular kinds of peace operations, there are many different kinds of configurations or patterns that's there. And we're unable to find exactly, you know, what is standard pattern A that has this cluster of missions versus pattern B. There's lots of different mix and match different kind of combinations. When one looks at the number of missions, which will have a number of implications for what happens, you see the following. Only 12 of those operations, less than 20%, involve UN operation, UN operations that have only one mission. And disproportionately, almost all of those are the traditional ceasefiring monitoring missions, and they date disproportionately to the Cold War era. But as you look, going down that table, you'll find that there's lots of mission operations who are asked to do many missions. In fact, the average UN operation over that more than almost 70 year period has 4.5 missions to perform, meaning they're asked to do many different things. And when one looks at 
patterns over time, UN operations in the post-Cold War era have twice as many missions on average as what happened previously. And one of the consequences of those is they require more peacekeeping soldiers, they're often more expensive, and potentially they, they could last longer in terms of the long-term process for that. So one of the takeaway points is that peacekeeping and peace operations, at least in the UN context, and applies as well to the African Union, is it's not your grandfather's peacekeeping operation by any stretch of the imagination. Not only are they more frequent, but they're fundamentally different in what they're asked to do. And what they're asked to do goes beyond many of the traditional kinds of ceasefire or might, might be closer to uh, conventional military kinds of functions or tasks that they're asked to do there. They're really now actively involved, not just in stabilization kinds of functions, but also ones in restoration of the society for long-term kinds of benefits. The question that my project is looking at in a central fashion is the issue of compatibility. If peace operations are now asked to do a wide variety of different missions, how compatible are those different missions with one another? In effect, not just can they multitask doing more things at once, but can they do many different things oftentimes at once? There are implications there for how successful they can be trying to do all those things, as well as some implications for how one trains peacekeeping soldiers to perform the variety of missions. So what my colleagues and I have done is we identified 12 characteristics of peace operations that are there. You'll see those listed in the far left-hand column on the slide. And for each one of those, we developed a continuum, two endpoints, on where a given peace mission in an ideal sense might fall. So for example, what's the role orientation of this particular mission? Does it place them as a primary party in the conflict? or are they more of a third party, a little bit distance from the conflict, or something in between? The conflict management process, does it promote integrative kinds of outcomes, positive sun ones, or is it more on the other end of the continuum, more of a zero sum or distributive? How much interaction or focus is there on the local population? Is it high? Obviously, rec uh, restoration or reconciliation intimately involves the local population, whereas other kinds of missions, such as cease mo fire monitoring, the traditional, really does not involve the local population very much. It's often separating two uh, distinct military forces. Does the peace op mission involve involve impartiality, one of the members of the Holy Trinity? Or is there low impartiality where they really have to take biased political action? How easy is it to get out? What's the potential for mission creep? To what extent does this mission now have to involve coordination with other actors, namely international organizations in the form of non-governmental organizations, the World Bank, um, the Red Cross, or with the host government. In the past, ceasefire monitoring was something that was carried out by peacekeeping soldiers largely alone. But when you're starting to talk about building local government structures, security sector reform, you're not just having the responsibility fall to the peace operation. It requires coordination and cooperation from other actors. How much control do they really have over the mission itself? both in terms of what can the peace operation do, how are the rafters involved, but what's the 
uh, environmental context they're operating under. How much is this costly? These missions involve additional costs in terms of resources, potential fatalities that are involved, the number of troops. Do we have a short-term orientation? Election supervision, things like that are often short-term orientation that begin with the registration process and end with the end of the election. Other kinds of processes like developing local governance or security sector reform really are long-term kinds of goals. And finally, how much institutional change within the host society is required there? We took those 12 characteristics, cross-referenced them with the nine missions that I outlined to you previously, and coded along that one, two, or three continuum scale on how those missions matched for that. So a traditional peacekeeping mission is really a third party kind of mission that doesn't focus much on the local population. It's designed to be impartial, uh, has a relatively easy exit. There's not that much mission creep. It doesn't require a lot of coordination. It has great control of the mission, doesn't cost a lot. It's a long-term orientation and doesn't require institutional change. So we went through each of the missions in an ideal type and then coded them on where they are. And so you can get a mission profile on these 12 characteristics that gives you a sense of what that mission looks like. The next step then is how compatible or similar are those nine missions to one another based on those 12 characteristics. Now, I'll save you the details of the multidimensional scaling analysis, but imagine if you're looking at two missions that had the same scores or codes on all 12 of those characteristics. Well, we would say that they're compatible. They're, they're identical in the sense that you would then say that they're, they're being asked to do the same thing, play the same kind of roles, and probably involve the same kind of tasks and skill sets that are there. If they're opposite of each other, they're just considered to be incompatible and therefore very different from one another with some notable implications then. Let me show you in a graphical sense the results of that multidimensional scaling analysis on where those peacekeeping missions map to each other. So how similar are the missions? Note in the far right-hand corner is that traditional peacekeeping mission. That's where it stands when one configures and puts together all the 12 characteristics. First thing you notice is it's not that close to all the other kinds of missions. So if we're asking peace operations and peace soldiers to do something different, we're asking them to do things that places them with different orientations, roles, and goals than what the standard mission is. But recall, we're also asking them to do that traditional mission as well. Closest perhaps to the traditional mission, perhaps isn't surprising, are some standard security or stabilization elements, DDR, disarmament, because that involves monitoring or working with local security forces, that security sector reform. But as we move to the blue triangle, you're looking at a series of other things which share common characteristics, election supervision, protecting human rights and humanitarian assistance, which move them a little bit further away from being impartial and involve different kinds of roles and orientations that are there. And farthest away to the rule of law, local governance and reconciliation, what are often classified under peace building kinds of activities are ones that are the greatest distance from most of the other missions, and in particular from the traditional kinds of ones. 
There's lots of involvement of local population. Uh, there's often kinds of long-term kinds of orientations that go with those. There's great coordination involved with other actors. So as we've moved in to the era of UN peace building, we're asking now peace operations and the constituent soldiers not only to do more, but to do different things. Now, our research actually has, has applied this to all 70 UN peace operations, and we have three different measures of compatibility that are based on logics of multitasking. Can you do more? There are other measures that's based on the issue of of compatibility, because sometimes if you ask a peace operation to do DDR and traditional ceasefire monitoring, there's a lot of the same skills and other things that may actually be helpful. And then we have another particular measure that's based on both the multitasking and compatibility idea combined with the idea that over time, peace operations and soldiers can learn. I'm not going to present those today, but I want you to start thinking about the idea that when we ask peacekeepers to do more than we ever have before, and we're asking them to carry out missions for the UN or any agent, there are a number of potential kinds of implications that go from that. The first and often the of most interest uh, to my own research project is what difference does this make for mission success. Most evaluations, at least in the scholarly community, focus only on traditional ceasefire monitoring, meaning they evaluate, did you stop the violence? Did you keep the area stable? But that ignores all the other kinds of missions that are there and misses a more holistic assessment. When we start thinking of multiple missions, as part of the whole peace operation, we can start wondering and say, our success in one mission or missions prerequisites for success in later missions. One might think in mind, and one of the things we're exploring is the possibility that if you're not successful in the security missions, which you might call a security first orientation, Meaning if you can't keep the ceasefires, you can't stop the violence, and you're unsuccessful in DDR, you're not going to be successful in having successful elections, much less being able to establish the rule of law and protect civilians. So that's one consideration. The second thing that we're investigating, is there some type of optimal sequence to which these missions are performed? So far, I've treated them to say, well, this operation has eight missions. So the, mission, the first mission in the Congo had eight different missions, but those weren't performed all exactly at the same time. There was a sequencing element here where security missions uh, began first, then gradually you moved to elections, and it was only reconciliation and restoration efforts that came more at the tail end of the 10-year deployment. But from a policymaking standpoint, should we have peace operations not try and do everything at once? Is there an optimal sequencing? The other thing to consider is whether they have, whether there are different roles that are incompatible or compatible. Do those help or hurt mission success? Can you have the same peace operation and soldiers, on the one hand, use offensive military force to protect civilians and attack a rebel group, and at the same time, try and deliver humanitarian assistance to areas that are controlled by that rebel group. Those are different missions, but they have very different role orientations, implications for impartiality and the like. And that's something that we might start thinking about that maybe in true Sesame Street fashion, these two missions go together, these are different, and they're not ones that could be there. I've already said that when you actually look at actual profiles of UN operation, there is no sort of 
one or two combinations or common combinations of missions. But we ought to ask ourselves, is there an optimal mixture of missions? That is to say, when there's a peace operation given a given particular context after a civil war, are there some set of missions that should be performed? Meaning first, are we missing anything? Is there another mission that would help make the others more successful? And the other side of the coin is, is there a mission we probably shouldn't try because it undermines the success of the other missions? So I think we start thinking of mission success, start looking a little bit more about how these missions go together in what order. In terms of evaluating the operation, I've indicated that past has been, did they stop the violence? But success is not binary. Stopping the violence is only one piece of the goals that are looking to achieve through the UN. And then we're making assessments for UN peace operation or the military units that compose that is when you find something to be successful or more likely unsuccessful, how much praise or blame goes to that peace operation? If there's a failure and a breakdown in a state, the local government falls apart, corruption increases, the rule of law is not established, is that really the fault of the peace operation or do we need to look elsewhere at the environmental context that it was that was put in place or the other actors involved? I think that has implications, not just to who we give a pat on the back or a kick in the rear. I think it also means the kind of future planning and, and adjustments that we make are important to understand why there was success and why there was failure and what are the limits that peace operations can do. From a training perspective, I've thought about this problem for a long time. Going back uh, almost 25 years was part of a National Academy of Science uh, panel that looked at new roles for the military. And among the things we examined were training kinds of issues. Soldiers are trained very well to perform traditional military missions. And in fact, uh, much of the training in traditional peacekeeping during the Cold War was, as a, a Canadian peacekeeper told me, about 95% the same as you would carry out uh, for military operations. But now we're asked them to do a lot different things, not just combat skills, but contact skills, and integrating with a lot of other local actors. Can we train them to do different kinds of missions? How does that training would have to be changed before you deploy them? And then how do we then integrate, not just within the U.S. military, but within national militaries, because peace operations are made up from anywhere from 10 to 30 uh, different countries in their own militaries. And last, I think we have to ask ourselves as we pile more and more on peace operations, should other actors really be responsible for carrying some of these out? Are peacekeepers really suitable for this and are really asking too much to ask of them in going forward. Well, that's my sense of trying to get you to um, think about different kinds of peacekeeping, but it's changed dramatically. And now I think we need to really rethink what we're doing, how we're doing, how we evaluate that, and how we plan for that. And that's one of the purposes of my multiple missions, peacekeeping. Uh, project to look broadly at peace operations beyond ceasefire monitoring and understanding what those implications are, not just for the UN, but all the way down to how we train those. So thank you. I'd be glad to do some chat and uh, discussion. Brandon, you're going to referee all that? Yes, yes, I will. Um, so, please, if you have questions, raise your hand or type something in the chat, and I will call on you. Uh, let me kick off and ask a few questions. Um, I mean, I really want to dial down on the key finding here, you know, that, that there are mission sets that typically don't overlap in peacekeeping. And I'm curious about your assessment about what are our needs, particularly in terms of education. And um, I don't know how far you've gone on this process, but um, 
What are your assessments on U.S. military training for peacekeeping, and uh, what do you think we need to change, if anything? Well, I, I think there's several things. You know, much of this does go back, granted, 25 years to when we advised the Army about what to do. And at that time, I think the idea was is that you moved up the chain of command. The training that we would, you know, we would give, you know, the basic soldier may be able to be stay the same. But as you moved up to a lieutenant, a force commander, or others of those who were in charge of the U.S. military component of a peace operation, you really needed to emphasize some more what we called contact skills. And those maybe involve greater ability to negotiate because sort of military skills of fighting are useful, but commanders need to have a better understanding that if they're dealing with local actors, they may be dealing with rebel commanders, they need to negotiate an end to shelling of civilians or actions. That, you know, that may not be something that is uh, conventional kind of military kind of training. The second things that we've kind of emphasized is the interactions with the local population. Um, other local actors and governments require a little bit better um, cultural sensitivity and cultural understanding of where you're being deployed. And maybe two to three weeks uh, of training ahead of time may not be enough uh, for that. It's not clear to me, and I don't know enough about military training other than I, I do know something about the war colleges. Uh, I don't know how much, how much or to what extent there's training that involves working with non-military actors and those kind of interactions and elements that, that go along with that. And I think those are the kind of training education and others that provide the kind of flexibility you need for these new missions. I also, though, do wonder whether the militaries ought to really rethink and say, should we be doing some of these? Are there other, um, are there other agents or international organizations or other parts of the government that are better suited for those? And then we're playing a much more supplemental or coordinating kind of role than really being at the forefront. Okay. Well, I, I hope we're doing a lot of that. It's tough to know, though, because the, the PME community has so much depth, and there's so many schools, so I'm not sure who is responsible for what. Um, we certainly have some responsibility, especially in cross-cultural communication. Yeah, I mean, things are, I think things are a lot better than they were years ago in a recognition kind of of that. But, you know, there's also, I sense in doing interviews and others, is – those from military forces and not just from, you know, the United States are often reluctant to take on these new missions because they don't feel that they sort of belong in the military's, you know, wheelhouse, that, that they're different or that's not what they're, they should, that's not what they're trained for and that's not what they should be trained for, for that. And so there is some reluctance, uh, uh for that. Other kinds of national militaries like the Canadians and others see that as much more of their core mission there is to serve peacekeeping, whereas I think within the U.S. military, um, many of these peace building or stabilization missions are considered more at the periphery and not the core. No pun intended on the Marine Corps, but they're not the core. Yeah, so there's two trains of thought I want to take this in, and they're kind of divergent, so we'll go down one path. Um, there's been a recent shift in the DOD and the U.S. military towards a return to a great power competition. Right. And you, of course, have done a lot of work on that over the length of your career. And I'm curious about your reaction to that shift in light of also the work you're doing on peacekeeping. Do you yeah. think that this is going to be a negative overall shift for our ability to manage uh, peace and reconciliation after conflicts? What's your what's your read on the future, given this sort of change in direction? Yeah, I think that kind of the sh the pivot to Asia – and the, the shift more to the great power orientation, particularly with a China focus and to a lesser extent, I think it's going to make some of the peace building or state building uh, kind of orientation of the U.S. military much less of a focus. Um, and I think that's manifest in two ways. The U.S., I think, is going to take a lot less interest in that. I mean, obviously, some of it depends on the results of the election next Tuesday and the leadership. But I think 
there's already a kind of a pullback uh, in terms of supporting the UN or supporting peace building or state building kinds of operations, even if they're carried out by other kinds, uh, other agents other than or involvement by the US. And when you look at a place like Mali, where France has been heavily involved and the UN, it, there may be a pullback in terms of peace building orientations, perhaps much less ambitious that we may be back to just stabilization, just keep a lid on it. And some of the more ambitious ideas of building a democratic society, um, promoting regional stability, it's just not gonna be as important, particularly in places like Mali that are, are not considered uh, key areas for US or other major power interests. So in some ways, we, there's a chance we may go back to have some of the same kind of uh, focus that was during Cold War. Uh, they're still authorizing peacekeeping operations, not as many. They're still giving them lots to do. But like I said, when you look at the Congo or, or Mali, it's just not, uh, it's just sort of the, the idealism that might have been present in the 90s that has been lost somehow. And then the other train of thought I want to go down is this issue of tolerance, right? That you have a finding that peacekeepers need to play a role in promoting tolerance and reconciliation among former disputants. And that work, of course, dovetails with your work on rivalry and other research that you've done before. Um, a friend of mine, Sam Witt, has a lot of great uh, public opinion finding about Syria and how the majority of combatants there are in it for an existential reason. They're in it for the complete and utter destruction of Assad, given the personal kind of affronts that he's done to his family and their community. So how do we deal with this issue of tolerance? How do we promote tolerance? How do we, in short, end rivalries? And, you know, what role does the United States have to play in that? I think of all the different kind of new missions, it might be that the re the reconciliation one is the most difficult. And I say that not just because it's a long-term kind of goal, but you are asking for attitude change between groups who hate each other and have just experienced war where there may have been significant atrocities that have taken place. And I think outside forces and peace operations are limited in those kinds of missions uh, because it's not exactly something they can do themselves. It's, it's in many ways, from what we know of studies of reconciliation, truth and reconciliation commissions, is those have to be more bottom-up processes, processes rather than those that are imposed. And yet in places like the Congo, um, a lot of what the UN, UN peacekeepers have been left to do is they were given responsibility for uh, capturing and in some cases bringing to trial in domestic courts perpetrators of atrocities during the Congo War. Congo War. That's not necessarily an effective kind of use of military kind of soldiers. And the one dilemma that I find in particular is there may be a trade-off between reconciliation and justice. So when you look at Sierra Leone, Mali, the Congo, or elsewhere, there have been a number of, or Syria, there's been a number of human rights violations. The dilemma I have is how do you ensure that those who committed war crimes are held responsible, which are often one side, the losers. At the same time, you promote reconciliation, which is predicated on forgiveness and moving on for that. I, I think that that's very difficult and it's not surprising then that the UN, the US and others settle for, let's just stabilize it and not make sure that there's not any more fighting because the other one takes too long, too much money and it's too hard and we can't do it. Um, 
I'm getting something in the chat. Is that from Valerie? Yeah, this is Colonel Jackson. I'll let her ask the question if she can. Colonel Jackson? Yeah, hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks for that. Um, so getting back to some of your earlier comments about, you know, just these skill sets inside the military, they are, there are those skill sets in the civil affairs, military occupational specialty, um, and the, in the Army and the um, Marine Corps have this specialty in various forms and sizes. Um, most of them are in the reserve component, however. Um, but we do have more than 20 years of coin experience at this point, um, stability operations, you know, where, where local um, commanders were forced to deal with civilians, both in the battle space as, um, you know, folks living there, local populace, but also civilian aid workers from a variety of countries. And having been one of those people, what you find yourself in is, is um, a pickle because you're, you're torn between the people that really, you know, would rather you're not there, um, even though you're sort of helping them in the short term, um, and then the civilians that have, you know, want you there in their country to, to calm things down, but then don't want you to stay a second longer. Uh, and then the aid workers who are sort of resentful that they need your presence there um, to protect them so they can do their work. So, so my question is, in, in all your research, you know, how, how does a military force avoid being viewed as that arbiter um, when they really, you know, are only there because, you know, the, a government has called them to be there and our government uh, allowed them to go? Well, uh, well, that's very well said on several dimensions. Um, you know, life was easier for peacekeepers back in the Cold War because they were put in place often between two different countries. Both countries agreed to have them there. The deployment area may have been along a demilitarized zone or a traditional ceasefire line not connected to a civilian population. The problem now is you're not just dealing with two state-to-state -state actors, you're dealing with multiple actors the government and many groups. So I think it's a big challenge for peacekeepers and soldiers first to be placed in a conflict where you may have some of the actors initially supported you being there, but there are still other kinds of militias or groups who don't support you and will actively oppose you. Okay. Um, in in international relations research, we often call those spoilers. They're ones who uh, can wreck the peace, even though there may be consensus among the main combatants. That's difficult. The roles, I think, also make it difficult, is we think of humanitarian assistance and the military delivering it or guarding shipments as being altruistic and impartial. But food aid and medical aid is often used as uh, weapons of war by one side or the other and, and prevented from going to certain areas that their enemies control. That's complicated. And I really like that you brought up the, the point that protecting civilians sometimes puts those peacekeepers in great opposition to other groups who have an interest in attacking those civilians or driving them out of certain kinds of areas. So I think it's it's a much more difficult um, kind of mission kinds of missions is when you add establishing the rule of law, humanitarian assistance in this context, and I think that's one of the big changes. And I'm not sure. I mean, we can train more in contact skills, and the U.S. military has gotten a lot better on that. Um, but it isn't clear to me that training alone isn't going to solve it. And dare I raise the issue that when you're in a peace operation or some of these areas, it's not just U.S. soldiers or those, shall we say, from uh, well-trained national militaries, but there are others, uh, there are other militaries who are there for political purposes to have brought broadly representative under the U.N. flag who may not have the same kind of training orientation that those of other national militaries have. Was that was that uh, polite enough? 
I think it was, and that was actually uh, another comment that I just had is that, you know, a U.S. peacekeeping force or Canadian is one thing or Australian, but when you have sort of local peacekeeping forces that, you know, don't have the training that we do um, and don't respect the international norms, especially with regards to protecting women and children, then you have massive problems. Yeah. Um, so this is this is a much deeper and more complex issue than um, I think we can cover probably in a, in an hour. But right. I think I'll let someone else ask a question. No, I agree. And I'll, just let me say a little more about that. I think one of, one of the trends that you see in peace operations is I won't call it subcontracting, but there's been greater roles for peacekeeping, particularly carried out by the African Union, and it, it therefore it's going to mean that you're going to have peacekeepers from different kinds of national militaries, often those from countries that border the conflict uh, in question and may have a particular interest in the outcome or affiliations with local groups who are participating in that conflict. And on the one hand, that allows the U.S. and parts of the U.N. to sort of wash its hands and say, well, let the Africans do it. Uh, but on the other hand, it creates some problems of uh, efficiency, neutrality, effectiveness um, that uh, are, are created when you push off an international responsibility to other kinds of agents. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> if, if, this is Lieutenant Colonel Brewer, if I could just jump in real quickly. I was a UN peacekeeper in 2017 in Mali. Uh, for eight months. And um, there are no U.S. peacekeeping units. We go there only as staff members. In fact, in 2017, I think we only had 32 U.S. service members in total deployed. So there's there aren't U.S. Uh, units right. there, just, to, just as a point of clarification. Yeah, no, no, I knew that. Yeah, that's right. But U.S. plays a role in supporting that particular U.N. operation. There are advisors and things like that. But uh, right. But, but from a UN standpoint, the Mali operation, particularly with help from the French, might be the new, the new model of stabilization sort of only and trying to restore government authority to a broken country without a peace agreement. Right. I guess I think the only thing I was going to point out is, you know, um, just to touch on the fact that it is it's an absolute pickup game. And, and the U.N. is unfortunately at the mercy of, you know, they're asking for these type of capabilities, these type of units. Um, you know, they might want people who have expertise in X, Y or Z. But at the end of the day, they get what they get. Um, and it's it's not ideal. It's absolutely a very difficult job. I mean, we as the. You know, I think the U.S. is the supreme fighting force in the world, and we've been in Afghanistan for how long? And it's because these missions are so difficult and so, um, you know, just difficult and challenging on, on many levels for economic, political, legal, you name it, types of reasons, never mind cultural language barriers, all that kind of stuff. So just want to point out that the problem is so complex. It's 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 not just throwing on more training or anything like that. I mean, half these units show up, they don't have uh, good equipment and things like that, even though I know the U.S. is the number one supporter of, you know, financially for equipment and supplies and supply chain stuff, but it's it's turned over to those peacekeeping units to manage that supply chain and to manage the actual maintenance and the downtime of that of those assets. So it's challenging. Uh, in the military perspective, one of the things that I think um, I thought was interesting to look at was the timeline. You know, if you go over as a regular military deployment a year or six months, it's just not long enough. You know, I know we find that challenging for us here in the U.S. and our deployments. But these again, these problems are so big. Um, you really do need to look to some of these civilian experts while you're over there because they've been there for three years or four years. I mean, they do these enduring missions. And then unfortunately, they kind of look at the military and say, hey, you know, so so glad you're here. But at the same time, you're going to be leaving in six months and this problem's bigger, you know, bigger than what you're going to be able to help solve. You guys want to come in, do some stuff and, and turn around. So those units, you know, especially the African ones with a little bit more staying power because they're so close to home really do have such a huge advantage. I know there's a lot, there's downsides, as you pointed, maybe with the, the conflict, but um, even in Mali, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people speak French, but the preponderance of people are speaking Bambara, and the French don't speak Bambara. Uh, 
So, you know, difficult to, you know, without the locals. Just just some points just to throw out there wow. that it is extremely complicated. Yeah, you raised lots of uh, different kind of things. Uh, you know, one is the troops from different countries. The quality of those vary, and there's a lot of good international relations research on why states send particular peacekeeping soldiers, and it's not always for altruistic, and they're not necessarily sending their best. Um, in those kind of conditions, there are operational uh, issues of coordinating uh, involved. And then, yeah, there's also the particular kinds of rotations. Remember, I said that for some of these missions and goals, they're long term, but not only are the particular soldiers deployed there for the long term, but the operation itself isn't necessarily long term. Um, <clears throat> during the 1990s, the average peace operation was something like two and a half years. Well, maybe that's enough time to go supervise a ceasefire, hold elections, but, um, you know, my, my general view has been of UN peace operations and peacekeeping in general is they are the equivalent of a rude dinner guest. They arrive late and they leave early. And you can't necessarily put some of these countries back, back, back together again, if at all, like in Afghanistan, but you're not going to do it in a short term. And supervising a democratic election that goes mostly okay, declaring victory and lead does not deal with the kinds of problems that you're facing on the ground. Well, great. Thank you. Does anyone have any follow-up questions or other points they want to raise with uh, Professor Deal? Okay. Well, uh, failing that, um, I'll ask Paul to wrap us up with uh, what work do you have coming up? What are you working on now and where are you going with your peacekeeping research? Okay. Well, I've got, um, I've got uh, just had two articles accepted that'll be coming out. One is uh, uh, you saw some of the graphs from it, which looks at how to measure compatibility for peacekeeping operations in three different ways. And then we have a case study that uh, is of uh, the Congo during 1999 to 2010, looking at issues of compatibility there. The, the big project is a book project, which, which has Congo as one of the case studies, but looks at five other ones both historical ones in the Congo, in East Timor, in Sierra Leone, and the like. And what we're hoping to do with that peacekeeping project is to get a sense of what are the answers to some of the questions I raised, namely, are some mission success prerequisites or necessary conditions for others? What do we know about sequencing? And should peace operations be trying to do all the things that they're doing or not? So trying to get that what I call the holistic or big picture view of operations. And uh, we hope to have that done uh, next summer. Uh, since we all uh, have, uh, we all have now a lot more free time, right? No. <laughs> I'm scared. You and Pat James have said you have a lot of free time to write, and I can barely no, watch. No, I don't. I don't have any. I'm an administrator. I'm a faculty member. I'm a teacher. Yeah. Um, I probably worked harder than I have at any time in my long faculty life. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll second. It, it feels it feels worse and more repressive than ever. And with that positive note, I'll turn it over to Major Brown. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Valeriano, and thank you uh, to Paul Deal for coming on and giving us some great insight into um, what you know many in the audience have seen firsthand as a very difficult mission. So we thank you very much for doing that. We'll have this up on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And to everyone else who's here, thank you for listening to this week's broadcast. We'll be taking a break for a couple of weeks, but we will be returning on November 19th. So make sure you're following us on social media to get the details and the registration information. We'll see you all then. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.